Turning now to access to justice in New York. If you watch this show, you already know how complicated New York's court system can be. But in just the past few years, it's completely changed. When COVID hit, courts went online, which allowed a lot of cases to move forward. But it also opened the door for more changes as the state's courts reach an inflection point post-pandemic. And there's a lot to that. So for more on the future of New York's courts and access to justice, we spoke with Hank Greenberg, a shareholder at Greenberg Traurig, who chairs the state's commission to reimagine the future of New York's courts. Hank, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Of course, anytime. So courts are a big, big system in New York. I mean, we have some of the most complicated courts in the country. You wrote an op-ed in the New York Law Journal recently, kind of talking about this inflection point in courts right now, talking about how during the pandemic, the court system in New York really changed. Can you describe what have, some of what you've seen? Well, we experienced a quiet revolution. Uh, the first two months of the COVID-19 pandemic ushered in more change than we've seen in 200 years. Um, historically, we've always viewed courts as physical places. And once we locked down and shuttered the economy and all of New York and much of the nation, we recognized in order to keep the justice system going that we had to move online. And so for a profession that is highly resistant to change, judges and lawyers are rarely, if ever, in the vanguard of change. They had no alternative but to move into online platforms. And thus the idea of a virtual court system came to be. What do you think the result of that is? Is that a good thing in terms of, we've had a backlog of cases for quite a long time in the state court system, um, but there are also concerns of, you know, virtual court, uh, maybe your order to virtual court and you can't get access to that either. Um, you know, is that a problem? And what do you see as the other top problems, if any, in the court system right now? Well, of course, COVID was a tragedy, but the net effect and result in terms of moving the courts online, uh, I think was all to the good, a terrific development. A silver lining, if you will. If you will. And, uh, you know, there were these trends and tendencies that you reported on when you were with the Law Journal creeping towards that, but COVID accelerated everything. Yeah. And I think we're now in a place where because lawyers and judges have become familiar, comfortable with dealing with certain court proceedings online, Zoom, a verb, all of a sudden took on a whole new meaning. Um, are now comfortable with it. And we're hopeful that it doesn't snap back like a rubber band to where we were before COVID. Right. I, I mean, you also write about the access to justice gap, which I think is part of this entire conversation. So we have kind of virtual court, which I think is more accessible to a lot of people. But at the same time, you write that this gap is getting wider, where low income and a lot of middle income people just can't afford attorneys, can't afford to even pursue litigation because they don't know how the state court system works and they don't have attorneys. Um, what do you see as the consequence of that? Do we have a system less just than we might if we went to a direction? Well, the justice gap, as some people call it, is really a chasm uh, that's widening into an abyss yeah. for which tens of millions of Americans are falling all the time. Um, lawyers, many in the public, understand that there is an access to justice issue. Civil cases cost too much, take too much time. Um, people don't really understand the process, and it's not in step with the digital age. So people understand that that's an issue. They've understood it for decades. What they don't understand is that it's metastasized into a crisis. I think people have a hard time wrapping their mind around the basic fact that two-thirds of all civil cases that are brought in the United States, one of the two parties is not represented by a lawyer. For low-income Americans, 92% of their legal problems, they have to navigate without a lawyer. Wow. Scholars now refer to it as lawyerless courts. Some courts, 90% of the docket, involve people who are not represented by counsel. It is a crisis because the cases in which people are in court, at least those who access the justice system, even though they don't have a lawyer, we're talking about cases that involve the most sensitive, important parts of their life. Are they evicted from their home? Are they the victim of domestic violence? Will they have to experience bankruptcy or debt, guardianship proceedings, child custody proceedings? These are highly complex, massively important for real people, and yet so many of them have to go to court without a lawyer. Think about this. A recent study places the United States 
115th out of 140 nations in the world in terms of accessibility and affordability of justice. Wow. 115 out of 140. This for a country that prides itself on equal justice under law. Is there a solution to that? I, I'm just thinking of, in this state, we have an affordability crisis, which isn't really, it is relevant to this conversation, but you know, I don't think the court system is causing the affordability crisis necessarily. But as people can't afford to even live here, I mean, I, I can't imagine that the thought would even enter their head to put money down to, uh, you know, keep an attorney on retainer, have an attorney file a lawsuit. Other solutions there to close that gap, do you think? Well, I do think there are solutions, but it requires us to think out of the box, yeah. um, to be more imaginative and creative than we've been in the past. Like I said, at least since the 1980s, people have recognized this as a problem. And historically, two solutions have been deployed, laudable, worthwhile, to significant degree effective, which is civil legal services provided by legal aid societies, and calling on lawyers to perform more pro bono services. Mm. They're very good, very important, and by themselves, they can't get the job done. So this is, I think, as many states across the nation are thinking about creative regulatory changes, some are controversial, some less so, People have advocated for allowing non-lawyers to perform certain services that lawyers today simply won't do. Mm. And in, especially in parts of the state where there are so few lawyers. Think of the North Country, for example. Yeah. So I do think there are those solutions. And then technology, I think, holds tremendous promise, not only to reduce the cost and expense and burden for people who aren't represented by counsel, but also to provide them with access to basic information about their rights. There's also another interesting trend that you write about in terms of jury trials. I think the public, when they think of courts, I think they think of jury trials as kind of what the default is, because when we see uh, you know, courts in mass media and, and you know, television shows, usually it's a judge and a jury and a couple of attorneys arguing. Right. But the reality is, is that most cases don't involve a jury, and that is going down, you're right. First of all, why? Do we know why there are less jury trials now? Well, I think the short answer is it's too expensive. Mm. Um, very few people can afford it. There are some categories of cases where the model for reimbursement for attorneys permits representation. For example, personal injury cases. Lawyers represent clients based on a contingency fee. And in those cases, oftentimes they will go to trial. Um, but you're exactly right. The uh, idea of 12 Angry Men, the movie, popular right. culture's idea from L.A. Law, of jury trials is more a cultural construct than it is a reality. The perfect truth is jury trials are rapidly becoming extinct. So, you know, what we believe, what many people in the world believe, many people in the know believe is that jury trials are common. They're not. They're not. And, and I was called for the jury, uh, jury one time. And I think on my second day, they told us it was a plea bargain. And, and I talked to my friends and family who have also been on juries, who all also told me that the exact same thing happened to them when they were called for the jury. So right. they, were, they got to be dismissed. You read about another problem that I think has been growing over the past two years, really, and it's this threat to judicial independence, the kind of encroaching on what courts should be and what courts should not be. Um, we see conversations about this right now in the U.S. Supreme Court with certain ethics scandals involving uh, Justice Clarence Thomas and, and another justice there. Um, the Supreme Court, though, is not courts in New York. We have a more robust ethics structure here where attorneys and judges can be reviewed and disciplined in that sense. Um, when you talk about judicial independence and, and why there are threats to it, tell me what you mean by that. Well... Let's put it this way. Informed criticism of courts and judicial decisions is, of course, acceptable and sometimes constructive and helpful. Sure. That's a given. But the new normal, the frightening normal, is finding elected officials launching personal attacks on members of the judiciary for particular decisions and even threatening political reprisal. That's something very, very new. Historically, Elected officials, executive and legislative branch officials, and by the way, this is a national phenomenon that we're seeing, yeah. had great respect for the independence of the judiciary, guarded it jealously. But we are living in this tribalized, polarized period in our politics, and we see it seeping into these assaults on the judiciary. And here's, it's not only irresponsible, it's not only unfair, unfair because judges can't defend themselves in the court of public opinion. Right. They can't speak about the decisions they've handed down. 
It's not only irresponsible, it can be dangerous. A recent study by the United States Marshal Service showed that there had been over a five-year period an 89% uptick in the number of threats and inappropriate communications toward judges, 4,000 wow. a year. So this is a very, very concerning thing. And you also see it, by the way, uh, being manifested in terms of bills across the country being introduced, designed to hamstring the judiciary and limit, it, limit its autonomy and independence. So these are very concerning um, trend lines. And I should mention, it, it seems very personal now. I could understand in years past, a judge issues a decision and a certain politician disagrees with that decision and then issues their own statement saying, I disagree with that decision. Now it's less, I disagree with that decision, and more, this judge doesn't know what they're talking about. They make it very much about that judge and them personally. They don't know what they're talking about. Their decision is wrong. Or in some cases, if a judge rules one way and then it's overturned on appeal, then the appeal court is the wrong one and they maintain that the judge is the right one. Uh, do you think that that only changes as our politics change? Is there a way to bring the temperature down there unless the public does too? I don't think there is, but I'm curious to know what you think. Well, part of it is heightening um, um, people's understanding of the consequence of these kinds of threats to the judiciary. Right. Um, making people understand that a basic pillar of American democracy, the safeguard of their individual rights and liberties, is having a judge who decides cases without fear or favor, based only on the facts and the law and common sense. You know, people speak about the rule of law and use the phrase all the time, but what does it mean? Mm. Well, one of the core bases of the rule of law is the apolitical administration of justice. So for people who would try to overtly politicize the judiciary, they're walking down a road that can lead to autocracy. So part of, I think, the reason why I'm hopeful is journalists like you are calling attention to this um, and making people understand it. Um, and uh, you see that more and more. So I'm optimistic and hopeful, but you're quite right. Sort of the larger political milieu in which we now live is having these consequences, not just in the legislative and the executive branch, but also the judicial branch. Right, and I think as we get people to understand more how the courts work, I, I also, I agree with you. I think we could bring the temperature down a little bit there. Um, I think people often don't understand that when a judge issues a decision, a lot of the time they have an opportunity, their party has an opportunity for an appeal, and that's just how the court system works. Um, there's a lot more that we could get through, and we'll have to have you back to talk about it. But in the meantime, Hank Greenberg, shareholder at Greenberg Traurig and chair of the Commission to Reimagine the Future of New York's Courts, thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. Now, some of that can be handled by the state's court system, meaning they have the power to change their own rules. But the legislature can also impact courts through more funding and legislation. Keep an eye on both. 